Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. We'll be starting in a minute or so. Okay, then. All right, so hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for another edition of our IRENA Insights webinar series. My name is Nadim Melqsous and I'm from the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn, Germany. For those of you joining for the first time, I'd like to quickly introduce you to IRENA and to our webinar series. So IRENA is an intergovernmental organization with 167 current member countries and another 17 countries in their accession process. We support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as the principal platform for international cooperation, a center of excellence and a repository of policy, technology, research and financial knowledge on renewable energy. And because our analytical work and our engagement with member uh, countries generates a lot of valuable insights, we're constantly looking for more ways to share those insights with you. And this is why we've launched this webinar series, which we run uh, nearly every other week, usually on Tuesdays. So we started this in January 2020 before the pandemic really increased this number of um, virtual events. And so far we've organized over 30 webinars on various topics. You, you can check them all, uh, including the recordings and presentations on the IRENA events website, and the link to that will be in the presentation slides as well as in the chat. So we appreciate that there are many other uh, longer deep dive webinars out there, but what we try to do here in this IRENA Insights webinar is on the contrary, to keep these webinars short. So they last approximately 30 minutes, which means that we clearly cannot cover everything, but the idea is to give you enough to decide whether you want to actually delve deeper into the topic. And we show in our presentations further sources of more in-depth information to help you do so. Um, next slide, please. So today, while you enjoy your coffee, tea, or lunch, in the next 30 minutes, I'm very excited to say we're going to hear from Daniel Russo. Daniel is an energy planning expert with the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center. Since 2016, He's been working with IRENA to conduct energy planning activities in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and is one of the authors of the recent IRENA and State Grid Corporation of China joint report on smart electrification with renewables, driving the transformation of energy services. Before I hand over the microphone to Daniel, just a few brief uh, usual housekeeping items that you're most likely all aware of from, all, from the other online events. So we're recording this webinar and we will post the recording and slides on the IRENA events website within the next 48 hours. You're on mute at the moment. If you have any questions for us, please use the Q&A function. If you're using the Zoom web platform and you can't access that, and then I think you can use the chat function there to ask your questions. And finally, please don't forget to give us your feedback in the short survey, which will be available after the webinar. Next slide, please. So I'm happy to say that we will hear from Daniel his key takeaways from this report, smart electrification with renewables, driving the transformation of energy services. This report examines recent trends in the relevant technologies and innovations, it sets out a possible long-term pathways for electrification with renewables, and identifies the priority actions to enable those pathways. So without any further ado, let me welcome Daniel. Please, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nadim. 
Thanks very much. I'm really uh, excited to present this work. Thanks everyone for joining uh, for this, yeah, a little brief, brief webinar that we'll have. Um, before I begin, just like to say up front though, um, once again, that uh, so this report as a result of cooperation with the State Grid Corporation of China. And for those of you who may not know, this is the, the world's largest grid operator. Um, so this is a joint report that was developed between IRENA and uh, SGCC, uh, shortened to. Um, so it's really benefited from uh, their perspective and also what they see as, as the key issues on this topic uh, in the next decades, really. Um, so just to say that IRENA is still continuing work with, with the State Grid Corporation of China. Um, we have technical cooperation in the coming years, so you'll continue to see uh, work on this topic between uh, the two of us, so we're excited about that. And so uh, before we even get into the, into the findings of this joint report, um, we'd just like to give a bit of the bigger picture how this topic fits in to the overall energy transition. Um, so this information that you see here uh, is just from the latest IRENA World Energy Transitions Outlook. Uh, this was just released last week and it's available on the IRENA webpage if, if anyone is interested to look closer at this. Um, and in terms of electricity specifically, and so the work shows a key role in, in two different ways. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, we see here on the left-hand side uh, in this chart that, that the supply of electricity uh, is going to change specifically, uh, uh, significantly, um, and, and really become more dominated by renewable energy. Um, and so this, what we see here, is the 1.5 degree scenario in this report. Um, and you'll see that there is a 90% share of renewables in electricity by 2050. Um, but at the same time, in addition to the supply changing, uh, the share of electricity in total energy demand is also anticipated to increase significantly. Um, so in this scenario, we have 51% of direct electricity uh, meeting final energy demand. And on top of that, there is another 8% of green electricity that's used to produce green hydrogen. Um, and these two things together combine so that we see on the right hand side, uh, in terms of mitigation of uh, emissions, uh, that the total contribution of both of these things, renewable electricity and the electrification of end uses uh, in overall global decarbonization contributes something around 45% of what's needed by 2050 in this scenario. Um, so it's really a critical part of the overall uh, transition that we see coming. Um, and this slide is just to show that this isn't just an IRENA finding either. Um, so the, the report that we're looking at today, the Smart Electrification Report, also contains a comparison of, of different scenarios at the regional and global level, um, as well as what State Grid so explored for the future in China. Um, so that's what we see here in this chart, um, the percentage of electricity consumption uh, at the bottom there. Um, so currently the world average is something around 20 to 25% of electricity use and final consumption. And China is also uh, right around this world average. Um, and so you'll see that most scenarios see something like a doubling of this figure by 2050. Um, and also to the right, we see the renewable share of this electricity uh, is also, uh, it varies across different scenarios a little bit more, um, but in each scenario, the key point is that we just see an enormous rate of increase from today. Um, and maybe as a side note, uh, just the, uh, the word electrification, the, the, the method of using electricity and electrification as a key mitigation, um, mitigation approach, it was the most mentioned in the latest IPCC climate mitigation report that was just released uh, yesterday. So this is, this is really something that's uh, an important topic right now. Um, so moving ahead, what, so we expect a lot of electrification of different end uses going forward. Where exactly is that going to happen more specifically? 
Um, and so this figure shows uh, an illustrative view of the current energy needs uh, for different sectors, uh, buildings, transport, and industry, the three main end use sectors, and how those can be met with different electrification technologies. So the green portion here shows the uh, current amount of direct renewable energy use, for example, biofuels, uh, the blue portion, the current amount of electricity use to meet the energy demand in these sectors. Um, and then the gray areas are the portions of demand which are currently met by fossil fuels to meet different types. Um, so these are indicative, it's a little bit illustrative, but uh, the breakdown is broadly something like this in the current statistics uh, globally. And so next to these gray areas, we see illustrative list of the alternative options. Um, and so this isn't an exact proposal of, of what will happen, but these are just what are currently most commonly discussed. Um, and since it's a bit of a short presentation, we won't go into every one of these, but just for example, we see here in the building sector, uh, the main uses of energy right now met by fossil fuels are things like low temperature heating and cooking. And so uh, your electrification technologies to replace those are things like electric stoves um, and heat pumps in orange there. Uh, to some extent, people discuss uh, hydrogen or e-fuels, electrified fuels that are derived from hydrogen. Uh, but the majority of this uh, would probably become from heat pumps, uh, just, just to show the different options available. And then same for transport, we see that uh, the use currently met by gasoline and diesel um, many will definitely have, have heard about how many electric vehicles are being sold right now. And this is also the projected view of what could meet uh, short to medium distance travel uh, as mainly electric vehicles. Um, but we also see that there are areas like jet fuel and other uh, dense fuels for long distance travel that might be replaced by electrified fuels. Um, and so the report goes into more detail about the, the level of maturity of, and the competitiveness of, of these different options, uh, because it should be noted that for some of these options, they're more limited in some sectors than others. So for example, in industry, there are so-called hard to decarbonize areas in industry, uh, so for example, cement making, uh, things of that nature, uh, where the options to uh, convert those to using electricity are there, uh, but they may not be as extensive or as mature as, as the options in other sectors. Um, and then just to say that this picture is, is actually changing quite quickly as a lot of these technologies are deployed. Um, so the costs might decline a bit more faster than expected for some than others. Um, so this is kind of just to give, in, give a sense of, of what the options are and where we currently stand in terms of electrification. But I think uh, one of the main things we want to get across here is that really importantly, this isn't the whole picture. So you can't just simply swap in uh, technologies that use electricity uh, and call it a day. Um, just, a, just a really simple example, you could electrify all of these gray areas, switch to technologies that use electricity, um, and you could still just produce all of that electricity with coal or gas. And so, and so this is not just a simple change the technology and, and we've fixed the problem. Um, at the same time, there's also an enormous amount of other infrastructure and operational changes uh, that aren't shown here that go along with this, uh, this transition, the switch. And so that brings us to the main topic of the report uh, that we're looking at today. Um, you can't, if you can't just swap in new technologies, uh, what is a smarter way to do it? What is smart electrification with renewables? And so this is a concept uh, that we look at in the report based on three broad trends. And so the first is what we just looked at. So a lot of new end use technologies that use electricity means that more and more services are based on electricity. So electric vehicles, electric stoves, heat pumps, uh, electrolyzers to make hydrogen, which we could go into later, 
Um, but this means that simply more and more sectors of the economy are running on the same platform, if you want to think about it this way. And this is actually something quite new. It's very different. Suddenly, for example, a peak in the demand for electricity for vehicles is affecting the electricity supply for uh, buildings and, and industry. Um, so this is something new. Uh, but importantly, if we look to the right-hand side of this, um, the supply of this electricity, as we mentioned, is going to come from the cheapest sources, which are renewables and uh, particularly solar and wind. And so these sources are decentralized. Uh, they have different types of uh, availability and quality across geographical scales, but also at different times. Um, and so the key point here on the upper right hand side is that, um, that this decentralization also means that demand is also increasingly becoming flexible, uh, both in time and in space. So you don't, we're seeing that uh, demand for energy is not just uh, simply happening at the same time now, um, it's actually moving to meet, uh, to make the best use of the lowest cost resources, which are uh, increasingly solar and wind. And so finally at the bottom, we have digitalization. And so this is just simply another trend that's happening at the same time. We have a rapid expansion of digital technologies. Um, and so this is allowing uh, much more efficient communication and operation across different end use sectors like buildings, industry and transport, but also along the sort of the energy chain of production, transmission, distribution and use. Uh, for example, something like smart charging of vehicles and smart heating of homes uh, can shift the demand uh, to when supply is least expensive. And so the key point of smart electrification is that it's all of these things together. You, you won't just uh, get this by doing two out of the three, uh, for example. I'll just go back to the previous example. You can, uh, you can electrify everything with new technologies, but without renewables, you could increase emissions. Um, another point, you could uh, perform a lot of uh, electrification, have a lot of new appliances that use electric, uh, electricity, um, but maybe without digitalization, the system is inflexible enough uh, to, to use all of the, the new solar and wind, which is coming at different times of, of the day. Um, so smart electrification for this report is maximizing the synergies between all of these things so that you can answer the question, how to use the most low cost renewable electricity in the most efficient way. Um, and so that's what this report discusses in more detail. Um, how exactly do you do this? Um, how do you use the most low cost renewable electricity uh, in the most efficient way? And so what we see here on this slide, uh, what this figure tries to show is that choosing the most optimal, if you want to say, pathway to get from where we are now to a system with a lot more electricity use, um, you have to really understand the full infrastructure landscape. We can't just assess these, uh, these electrification pathways for one sector at a time, uh, because in many ways, we're using now the same resource across all different sectors. Um, and so that means we're going to be building out common infrastructure uh, across production, transmission, distribution, storage. Um, and so because of this, there are actually a lot of different choices that can be made in one area that will affect the whole system um, altogether. So looking at this, at this figure here, uh, starting on the left, for example, uh, we see the generation and production uh, side of things in green. And here, the key option is whether we want to use renewable electricity directly in end uses, or what we would call indirectly as hydrogen produced from renewable electricity, 
or other synthetic fuels, um, which, which we usually refer to as e-fuels or electrified fuels uh, produced with green hydrogen as the base. Um, also in the central portion uh, here in red, um, there are some interesting questions uh, related to how much transmission and distribution uh, infrastructure is needed for each of these options. Uh, for example, you can locate the electricity production, the hydrogen production, or the e-fuel production directly next to end uses, or transport them through their own various transmission distribution networks. Um, also, there's a question, um, can you use existing transmission distribution networks retrofitted for these uh, for these new fuels, hydrogen and e-fuels, and is new infrastructure needed for that. Um, so finally, at the end, you see that there are the different end uses for different sectors, um, and the decisions you make regarding what type of technology to use in those end uses will affect the stages that come before it. So for example, if you decide to uh, electrify fully uh, with hydrogen in industry, uh, that means you're going to need to build out a lot more, uh, not only transmission and distribution infrastructure, possibly, um, but also looking up the chain, uh, this would require much more renewable generation. Um, because just to just to say that it's a, it's a complex picture here, um, but but the example that we give is that um, is that from the simplest direction of doing this, going straight from renewable electricity to the end uses um, is also what you would call the most infrastructure light. It, it requires the least amount of infrastructure, which is quite clear. You go directly from producing renewable electricity to uh, meeting the end use. Um, but every step further down this chain to hydrogen and e-fuels, uh, actually requires more renewable generation because of the conversion losses that are involved in these processes. So just for an example, you need something like two to four times the amount of renewable electricity for the equivalent amount of hydrogen to meet an end use. And then when it comes to these e-fuels uh, at the end of the chain there, uh, it could be something up to 10 times the amount of renewable electricity to meet the same amount of end use demand. Um, so it's, it's actually a bit more of a complicated picture uh, when you look at all of the system together. Um, and if you remember that there are also certain sectors where the options for direct electrification, maybe the, the simplest way, they might not be so available to us right now. So you can imagine perhaps uh, the cost to retrofit a building or an industrial process to use renewable electricity directly might be uh, prohibitively expensive. And so maybe it makes it worth it to use hydrogen or e-fuels and just build a lot more renewable capacity to deliver uh, the electricity that those things need. Um, so we don't want to cause too much complexity here um, since it may seem very difficult to, to actually know so what is the most efficient way to build the whole infrastructure here with this whole landscape in mind? How do you use the most low cost renewable electricity in the most efficient way? Um, but in the report, this is actually something that we reviewed. Uh, we reviewed a lot of uh, the latest uh, energy system modeling studies. Uh, there are about a, a few dozen of these that have actually tried to make this assessment. Um, and so the latest literature, even though not all of the latest studies managed to cover the whole infrastructure picture that we, uh, that we showed previously, uh, some might only deal with how do you electrify just one sector, um, but a good amount are now looking at this full picture. Um, and there's, there's a growing consensus about maybe the general principles for what's the least cost, the, the least cost, the least regret steps that you could do right now uh, to make system-wide electrification with renewables uh, most efficiently. And so you see uh, number one on this list is conservation and efficiency. Um, so 
why is that number one in, in across most of these studies? Uh, we have here just a very simplified, you know, if you want a rule of thumb of why these are ordered in this way. So in the big picture of transitioning all of this, uh, the landscape of infrastructure that we saw, um, the approaches that require the most infrastructure, um, especially building the most renewable capacity, um, those are the ones uh, that are the most expensive. It's very straightforward. Um, so clearly the least expensive approach is conserving the energy or making things more efficient uh, to reduce the amount of renewable electricity that you need in the first place. Um, so that is the first, uh, first option on this list. And second is to maximize the direct electrification with renewables where options exist. Um, so that is also quite an efficient way to do this regardless of the sector that we're discussing. If the option is there, it's usually uh, the one that, uh, that costs the least. And then finally, uh, the last kind of general principles to make intelligent use of the indirect electrification options, hydrogen and e-fuel, uh, because they do have advantages in certain energy dense uh, applications where other options to maybe conserve uh, or use directed electrification are not there. Um, and in terms of system-wide flexibility, so uh, so both of these options can be quite easily stored. Um, they can be used across, let's say, hard to decarbonize uh, sectors in different areas. Um, so these advantages could make them worth the, worth the investment. Um, and then a final key point here is that even though some of these might be less costly, the overall system level, you should still be planning for all three of them at the same time, because a lot of this infrastructure takes a long time uh, to build. And so those were some general principles that we found in our study of the, the latest, uh, latest literature on electrifying the whole, whole system of energy with renewables. Uh, but in addition to the, these general principles that, that we found, the report also has a lot of detail on more specific smart electrification strategies that make sure we're building the system-wide infrastructure most efficiently and make sure that we're not risking, for example, an enormous increase in peak electricity demand, which could place stress on the network operation, also network costs. Um, and so these fall within three broad categories. Uh, the first is to better manage demand in order to meet the lowest cost renewable electricity supply. Uh, the second is using new technologies to provide other grid services that are, that are going to be needed with a huge expansion of electricity demand. Um, and then third, expanding the opportunities for electrification in general. So let me uh, give some examples of these. So better managing demand to meet renewable electricity supply. So this is essentially shifting the timing of demand to match the best availability of renewables like wind and solar. And so this is a very different type of system that currently exists um, in which usually the flexibility is met on the supply side. Um, and so we have strategies here like smart charging, smart heating and cooling, seasonal thermal storage, seasonal hydrogen storage. And so these strategies, what they try to do is reduce both the daily and the seasonal peak, peak demands, um, while also making the most of when solar and wind are available, both during the day and also at different seasons. Um, so this is one of the key strategies that we see to make, to, to prevent sort of a, a lot of unnecessary infrastructure being made, being built to meet peaks. Uh, and then second, we have um, so a lot of these new technologies that use electricity can also provide other services to the grid. Uh, so for example, uh, electric vehicles, battery, uh, battery vehicles, uh, aggregators um, that aggregate different technologies uh, that are distributed 
in different areas uh, to provide ancillary services to the grid, things like voltage and, and frequency control, uh, emergency services. Uh, a lot of these technologies can do that as well, as well as hydrogen electrolyzers. So the electro electrolyzers used to produce the hydrogen can actually, in many cases, provide other services too. Um, and we found that uh, these different technologies, uh, their ability to do this can reduce the amount of infrastructure that's needed. Uh, and then finally, what do we mean by expanding opportunities for electrification? Um, so if an industry, for example, can't use electricity directly, and maybe it requires hydrogen or e-fuels, um, but a lot of industries are quite cost sensitive um, um, in the global scale of, of industrial competition. Um, and so we should start thinking about maybe moving the demand geographically to the best uh, supply of renewables. Um, so strategic siting of hydrogen production uh, to where the renewable resources are best, or even co-location of industrial production. Um, and we we already see this with, uh, with low cost hydropower and geothermal resources, for example, in Iceland uh, and the production of, of steel, aluminum. And so this is something that could be expanded to, to also include wind and solar resources as well. And so finally, I think these are just the last slides here. Uh, with all that in mind, what are the priorities, immediate next steps that, um, that let's say policymakers can, can take? Uh, just because this, a lot of this is quite new to a lot of, uh, a lot of those who work in the energy system for the past decades, uh, and especially regarding the planning for these things. And so that's actually the first thing that we have on our list of priorities is uh, simply to plan for all of this transition across all of uh, these different types of infrastructure. Um, because the electrification that we expect in the next decades is only going to happen if, if there is investment in all of that different infrastructure today. Um, so not just the electrical infrastructure like transmission and distribution lines, but also digital infrastructure, the, the smart grid infrastructure, smart meters uh, in buildings, for example, as well uh, places where there are uh, wholesale and retail markets for electricity. Um, there's going to probably be a need to shape or create those markets to better deliver flexibility um, across different sectors and also make the flexibility uh, uh, make it attractive with economic incentives. Because at the moment, uh, the things that we discussed here about uh, flexible demand are not always uh, the type of resources that markets are designed for right now. Um, and then uh, finally, we have uh, focusing on the societal aspects of this because it's a lot of uh, technical issues related to new uses of electricity and, and building out infrastructure. Um, but what we've seen, of course, is that any major infrastructure development uh, that doesn't have you know, the needs of communities and consumers on board faces a lot of maybe unexpected bottlenecks. Um, and so this is something that should be planned for right at the start. And then we do go into this a little bit more detail in the report. So I'll just quickly mention these because I think uh, time is running out now. Um, but in the different sectors specifically, there are also, also some priorities that can be, that can be made uh, in the coming years. So for example, transport, uh, we know that things like modal shifts and shifting to public transport can reduce the amount of, of energy and electricity that will be needed in the future. Um, so doing this first and then taking advantage of the, the synergies between electric vehicles and uh, renewables like solar and wind. Um, and then also doing a lot of research and development to see how can we electrify uh, other areas like long distance shipping, for example. Uh, buildings, a lot of the solutions we see are already there for buildings. And it's actually just a matter of, of pushing those existing solutions a little bit, a little bit um, 
more extensively by introduced standards, codes, regulations, uh, just speeding up the scale of deployment. Uh, industry, uh, there's a lot more sector specific research and, de and demonstration uh, and development that can be done in the different sectors. Uh, this is the area where uh, the fewest uh, electrification options exist, even though in the next decades, it's expected to be very significant, the amount of potential there. Um, and also here, it's more important to take a global perspective because a lot of these industries, as we mentioned, uh, face a lot of global competition and very price sensitive. And finally, for uh, hydrogen and e-fuels, um, there's a lot of discussion about this now, but I think a lot more needs to be done to understand the long-term role of these two things, uh, especially their economics in terms of overall system infrastructure versus other options. Um, so is it really the case that it's always um, the wisest thing to build hydrogen if we think uh, if we think that direct electrification of new using new technologies might be economically attractive in the future. So just I think a lot, a lot more long term studies into those two things are something that we found uh, is needed uh, in the future. So I think with that, that is everything. So thanks. Thanks, everyone for all the attention. Is a bit maybe a bit over time a little bit, but yeah, maybe we can take a few questions anyway. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, I think it was very interesting to really hear about the challenges of electrification, the proposed solutions and pathways, especially that last part. I think uh, should certainly be highlighted, especially after yesterday's IPCC report, where this was clearly shown to be a really key topic, especially for the coming years. Um, Unfortunately, our 30 minutes are, um, well, have closed about uh, a few minutes ago, so we won't have much time for questions and answer. However, I've been looking at the questions as well, and I think you've already answered some of them through the, your last slides. And I think uh, some of the others can be also found in the report itself. Uh, so I would also advise um, attendees to really um dig into this report if you're interested because it has a lot of interesting insights as daniel showed us today um so yeah so with that i would like to thank you all for joining us today i'd like to thank you daniel as well for the presentation and uh, thank you for your questions unfortunately we couldn't answer them uh, today but as i mentioned the report is there as well and uh, we hope you really learned something new today uh, with that, that's all from us uh, for today. I uh, wish you a great rest of the day and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, everyone.